So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Basic Surgery's Ophthalmology webinar. Um, sorry for the brief hiatus that we had, but we're back and we've got a new lineup coming uh, this month and so, in the next few everyone. months. Uh, welcome to Basic Surgery's and Ophthalmology. One thing that I would like to um, sort of point out before we start is we have, first of all, the wonderful Camille and Hassan here today. Um, they are both ophthalmology registrars. Um, so we're going to include some MCQs um, in the webinar. So we've got the link coming up for that very soon. Um, and if you do have any questions, then please don't hesitate to use the Q&A function that we have on both Zoom and YouTube. Um, so without further ado, I think we should start. Thanks, Rituja, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Hassan Naveed. I'm an SD5 uh, based in Royal Surrey. I'll be taking you through some questions at first. So, so the first question we have is a 63 year old right handed um, woman. Sorry, uh, do you mind going onto the previous slide so people can log in on Menti? Sure, sure, sure. Thank sure. you. Uh, so, we've got the QR code and I'm putting up the link if you want to use the link in the chat function. For you to log on to Mentimeter. Yep. So if you want to continue, thank you. That's great. Thanks, Rudita. So, um, so first question we have is a 63-year-old right-handed woman presents with a closed right eye. She has a background of hypertension and type 2 diabetes, has complaints of intermittent right-sided headache double vision and a droopy eyelid for the past week. She woke up this morning and found her right eye completely shut. On examination, you find that her right eyelid is closed. And when you passively lift the eyelid, you find that the right eye deviates down and out. The pupil is fixed and dilated. She's able to abduct and intort the right eye. The disc is normal as well as the left pupil in movement. What's the most likely diagnosis? Uh, please select one of the five answers at this stage. Perfect. Moving on to the second question. Uh, we've got a 30 year old male that presents with chronic lower back pain. Uh, and they complain of a painful red eye and blurred vision. The slit lamp examination shows the following. Please select one of the following options that you think is likely to indicate the diagnosis. Question number three. We've got a 29 year old that presents with a foreign body sensation, painful right eye, and it's associated with photosensitivity and blurry vision. The examination shows what we see in the picture. What is the immediate management to consider for this? Please select one of the five options. Question number four, we have a 26 year old woman that complains of blurry vision in the right eye. Her color vision is reduced and she has a relative afferent pupillary defect. All movements of the eye are very painful. Fendoscopy and neurological examination are unremarkable. The MRI brain that's undertaken reveals what we see in the image. What is the most likely diagnosis for this? Please select one of the five options. Excellent. Question number five, we've got a mechanic that presents to the eye casualty department with severely photophobic and a hyperemic right eye. A chemical has splashed into the eye. Which of the following substances is considered most dangerous to the eye? Please select one of the five, sorry, one of the four options. Uh, 
fantastic. Okay, we'll, we'll start with the session now. So uh, we're going to go through a basic anatomy of the eye and its anexa. And we'll go over some basic ocular examination principles which guide you to assess the eye and the patient properly. And in doing so, we'll also cover some common conditions and some emergencies. So when you look at the eye from a macroscopic point of view, you're able to ascertain a couple of anatomical features. You can ascertain the size of the pupil, how the pupil is responding. You can look at how clear the cornea is. You can look at the white of the eye, which is covered by bulbar conjunctiva. But if you look at the image on the right, you can see that the conjunctiva actually sort of involutes on itself over underneath the eyelid. And that is the palpebral conjunctiva. So it's very important that when you examine the patients, that you look underneath the lids to make sure that the palpebral conjunctiva also is not displaying any features which can guide your diagnosis. When you peel the skin off, you can see that there's a myriad of complexity that the ocular structures exist in. And so a couple of features I want to point here from an anatomical perspective is the orbital septum first. This really is sort of a, a border for defining the pre-septal tissues and the post-septal deep uh, orbit, which where, where more delicate structures are present. Also, if you look at the right side of your screens, you'll see that medially there's a lacrimal system that's present um, uh, close to the eyelid. And, and so if there's any lacerations or anything, you have to be very careful to preserve this and, and it requires more attention. The ocular structures are housed in the orbit, uh, which is comprised of seven bones. Um, and essentially it's a pyramidal structure with a roof, a lateral wall, a medial wall and, a, and the floor. The thinnest wall is a medial. Uh, and it's important to consider this particularly with core pathologies such as sinusitis, which can have effects on the eye and referred uh, pain and, and other symptoms as well. This is a cross section through the uh, orbit and what you can appreciate is that the globe actually sits quite anteriorly in the anterior third of the orbit. The rest of the structures are sort of, they get more and more compressed. So any pathology would cause compression and uh, have an uh, impact on the patient's visual um, perception. The other thing to note here, uh, the reason I've put this image is I want you to notice the superior muscle, which is the levator palpebri superioris. Now this is one of seven muscles that are under voluntary control, okay? So this muscle is responsible for lifting up the upper eyelid, okay? The other six intraocular muscles include the superior rectus, the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, and the lateral rectus, and the two obliques, the superior and inferior oblique. And the way these muscles work, they work synergistically and on both sides. So a small aberration in one muscle's function can have a significant impact on the two eyes working together and the patient, if it's it, if it happens quickly, the patient notices double vision. When we look at the globe, the globe essentially, the anatomy is divided into your anterior segment, which is lens and all the structures anterior to it, and the posterior segment, which is basically behind the lens. And the anterior segment is divided into two chambers. You have an anterior chamber, which is all the, uh, the the space in front of the iris and the posterior chamber, which is between the lens and the iris. The other thing to note is that when you clinically look at the fundus, um, you see an end artery and an end vasculature system, which supplies to the four different quadrants. There's the optic disc that you can see in the center of the retina, which is the macula. So you're able to ascertain you know, very visually what is exactly going on um, when you examine your patients. Other than these examination principles, there are certain things that 
we assess in our clinics, which give us an indication of the optic nerve function. And I think it's very important for um, everybody assessing a patient from an ophthalmology point of view to make sure that these things are followed because they don't require an, a slit lamp uh, firstly. So the first one is visual acuity assessment. This gives you an idea of how the patient's able to use their central vision. And classically it's recorded on a Snellen chart. The number on the top uh, shows you uh, the distance from the chart in, in meters. And the number at the bottom is what the letter the cor that corresponds to what distance that is. So normal vision is six, six. Uh, and when you're assessing this, you can use distance glasses or pinhole. Uh, for the for these patients. If you don't have a Snellen chart, the, there are apps that you can get on your phone, uh, which which can allow you to, uh, you know, to get a reasonable idea of a patient's visual assessment. If you don't have that, you can actually then put your um, ID cards at the end of the bed and see what the patient can read. And you can actually document that by comparing two eyes. It gives us some idea of what the patient's visual acuity is. The second indicator is color vision. And color vision, traditionally, you can use Ishiara plates. Again, if you don't have them to hand, you can use lots of different apps that are available both on Apple and Android marketplaces, which allow you to um, uh, ch check a patient's color vision. And if you don't have any of this, you can look at a person's red desaturation. So get the most brightest red object in your um, clinic. Usually the alcohol gels, they used to be quite red. You can just sort of get them to compare the right and left eyes and see if there is any difference. The other test we look for is visual fields. And this gives us an idea of uh, central field as well as peripheral field. And it's very simple. You ask the patient to cover one eye as they look at your face and you ask them if there's anything missing. And that gives you a rough idea of what is their central field like. For their peripheral field, you essentially are looking at the four, four different quadrants. And all you have to show them is your fingers in each of the quadrants and you just document it as that. If there is a gross defect, then that'll be picked up as a quadrantinopia or a heminopia. And uh, that's essentially what you're screening for. The last and the final test, which is very important is to look for pupil reactions. And you must always check for relative afferent pupillary defect because this gives you an idea of the uh, afferent pathway of the eye. And the idea essentially, if we, if we ignore the complex circuitry around this, what we are looking for clinically is when we swing light from one pupil to the next, we're looking for a recapture. If there is failure of recapture of that pupil when you swing the light to it, that pupil has the relative afferent pupillary defect, i.e. that pupil is not registering light. So I want to move on next to the common conditions. And I'll start by going through the uh, basic principles of how to assess a red eye. So when you get a patient that has a red eye and you have looked at it macroscopically, you've also looked at their conjunctiva, you can pick up a lot of things. The image on the left of your screen shows a sectoral confluent redness, which is sparing the limbus. This is most likely a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Whereas the image on your right displays fine vessels, lots of hyperemia, but when you look underneath at the uh, palpebral conjunctiva, you notice that there's this thick exudate. This is a membrane that can be associated with certain conjunctival problems like conjunctivitis and so forth. The commonest reason why actually we see red eye is because of blepharitis. And this is because what happens is that the eye gets, the eyelids get inflamed. And as a result of the inflammation that is, that, that, uh, is in the palpebral conjunctiva, you actually see it getting transposed onto the bulbar conjunctiva as well. So the patient will have a red eye, gritty eyes, itchy eyes, and this is a chronic problem. Some patients may have acne rosacea associated with it, but the management for this is very simple. You ask these patients to use lid hygiene uh, where they actually scrub um, using baby shampoo, uh, the, the lashes, and they also 
when there's when you've got clogged glands, as you can see on the top right of your screen, um, if you have clogged glands, you ask them to use sort of warm compressors and massage to sort of express these glands. In some cases, this doesn't work, in which case we have to then consider fusithalamic uh, ointment and also some, in some cases, oral antibiotics. And to comfort the patient's eyes, we consider duplicate drops. Sometimes blepharitis can get complicated. So blepharitis can cause uh, changes in your uh, flora of your of your eyelid and, and, and can result in conjunctivitis. So you will have discharge. If you have unilateral redness with discharge, uh, and if you look at their um, palpable conjunctiva, you'll see certain coalescence, as you can see here. These are papillae. Um, and this is pathognomonic for conjunctivitis. Now, conjunctivitis is essentially inflammation or, or infection of the conjunctiva, but this can also be viral. And the way to dis, uh, discern between them, there's a couple of things you can look for. In a viral, the patient will have peri or, or preauricular um, lymphadenopathy. Um, if you look at their palpebral conjunctiva, you'll see these little fine raised lesions called conjunctival follicles, as opposed to in bacterial, which you saw, which were a bit more, um, a bit more denser, so they're, they're called papillae. So you can uh, sort of gauge the difference between the two. Viral is almost always bilateral, and it looks really bad, but it's rarely, rarely a serious cause for concern because it, it, it goes through its own course. You give them supportive treatment with lubricants, but you don't have to um, sort of manage it sort of more invasively, unless they develop membranes or are not responding to that treatment. Another time when you can get bilateral conjunctivitis is with allergic eye disease, when the eye is not happy with an external um, uh, sort of um, allergen. And in, the, in these patients, when you look underneath their, um, again, underneath their palpable conjunctiva, you will see that they have extensive papillae. And this can be really problematic for some patients, but for some patients, this is just, just a seasonal thing and it goes away with some antihistamines. If it is very severe and not going away, then we, in our ophthalmology clinic, we consider steroids for this. But from a perspective of seeing these patients in A&E or seeing them on your wards without ophthalmology, I would not urge you to consider steroids at this stage. For some of these patients who have red eyes, they will have an additional feature of photophobia. And this can indicate the involvement of cornea. So when you stain them, you can see these little fine erosions uh, as on the right side of the image. So on the left side, you can see it, it, it'll classically look sort of mildly hyperemic, but actually when you examine them, there's significantly uh, staining and, and hence uh, there's a lot of photophobia. It, if it's associated with Allergic eye disease, these papillae that you can see, they can rub on the surface of the cornea, causing this sort of uh, features as well. So it's important to treat the cornea as well. And usually lubricants suffice with, um, with allergic eye disease. But for a bacterial um, disease, when you give them antibiotic drops, they will treat the surface of the eye as well. Now, very rarely, you can get cases like this as well, uh, where there's been photophobia, but when you look at the cornea, it's got what, what basically looks like an opacity. It's, this, is, this could be an abscess in the front of the eye and it stains. And on the right, you can see uh, where you can see this fluid level at the bottom. This is basically a hypopian. Pus has sort of settled inside the anterior chamber. So this needs to be treated aggressively. And where you will exercise caution is in contact lens wearer. So if you see an, if you see an abrasion or a, con, or a ulcer in a contact lens wearer, you always have to make sure uh, that you treat them slightly differently. So we use um, fluoroquinolones, uh, so fluoxacin or levofloxacin. Um, and this is because contact lens wearers, you know, they, they're more likely to grow pseudomonas species. Also, you must always ask your contact lens wearers that have they been in touch with a water body recently? 
And this is because you want to rule out any risk of acanthamoeba. If it is the case, then that requires prompt referral to your ophthalmology unit because that needs to be uh, treated with a, with, with a different, different treatment, really, uh, and also diagnosed uh, using confocal microscopy in most cases. So it's, um, it's very, very important uh, that you don't miss your contact lens wearers' uh, um, pathologies and they're treated aggressively, basically. Otherwise, you can also get uh, bacterial keratitis associated with bacterial conjunctivitis in severe cases. And common causes include uh, your strep, bacteria, staph, and pseudomonas, as I mentioned, in the contact lens wearers. So in the ophthalmology clinic, we do corneal scrapes to identify the pathogens. And we initially start intensive treatment, but then we tailor it down depending on how they're responding. Steroids, for all intensive purposes, should be are contraindicated in keratitis and should not be considered uh, when you see these patients uh, without any ophthalmic input. Sometimes you can get photophobia uh, in a situation where, you know, you'll see this sort of scant staining. Now, this is showing a very classic sort of fine uh, linear sort of staining on the surface. Often this is very, very subtle. So you have to examine the patient's um, buccal area to sort of see if they've got any vesicles. And this classically indicates herpetic keratitis. Uh, so this is a dendritic pattern. And this, does not, this is not gonna get better with antibiotics. So this requires a, um, using antivirals. So in this scenario, we use a cyclovir or gancyclovir ointment five times a day to treat this. Staying on the theme of photophobia, often you can get patients that have no staining on the surface of their cornea. Um, but they will have a hyperemic eye. And when you examine them closely, sometimes you can see other signs. Photophobia essentially presents because of a corneal problem or because of an inflammatory problem inside the eye. And this is obviously referring to the latter. So what you can see on the left side of the image are these sort of opacities. And these are actually depositions inside the inner layer of the, of the cornea because you've got so many cells in the anterior chamber that because of convection of are, are rotating around and they get deposited on the inner surface. On the right, you can see a misshapen pupil. And this is because the iris has effectively attached itself onto the lens posteriorly, and hence it doesn't dilate in certain um, regular patterns. So it, it makes these cauliflower pupils or or shapes uh, and so forth. So this indicates chronic infection. When you look at these patients on a slit lamp, we are able to ascertain whether there's any cells in the aqueous, which is normally clear. Um, and the reason for this is because the vasculature of the iris is normally um, not fenestrated, but it, because of inflammation, it leaks these cells and these cells therefore are seen. So ophthalmology is a very visual specialty and on the basis of pattern recognition and certain visual signs, you treat patients uh, appropriately. Acute anterior uveitis, the other classic telltale sign of that is the circumciliary injection, as you can see in the image in the middle. Um, and the the elements that get sort of deposited in the top right image are keratotic precipitates. The treatment for these patients usually is commenced through the ophthalmic clinic and it's important that we measure their pressures as well because certain, of certain patients when they get started on steroids, they have a pressure spike. So it's very important that we, they're promptly referred urgently to uh, the ophthalmic clinic. I just want to briefly cover sudden loss of vision and other conditions where you not, don't necessarily get a red eye, but there is loss of vision. So if you get unilateral loss of vision, it's very important to ascertain what, what the time scale is. Was it certain, did it suddenly happen? Did it happen over days? Did it slowly happen? Did it creep into their visual field? It's very important to elicit how did the visual loss happen? So if you get a sectoral loss, which lasts for a few um, uh, minutes to, to, to an hour or so in a patient that has vascular risk factors, you have to think of amaurosis fugax. So it's really important that you're, you're treating it, that patient as a TIA. So they have more risk um, systemically 
if, if left untreated. So these patients are often co-managed by the TIA clinic as well as the ophthalmologists who look at the back of the eye and make sure there isn't any damage done at the back of the eye. Often there is damage done at the back of the eye. So you can have vascular occlusion. So you can have artery occlusions. Classically, you get a pale retina, as you can see on the left side of your screens. Or you can get a block in the, in the venous system, which causes retrograde um, uh, pressure in the capillaries, which leak. And hence, you get uh, a lot of hemorrhagic appearance. Another thing I want to mention at this point is if you have patients who are over 60, you should have a low threshold for any eye symptom to conduct, um, uh, basically check for GCA. So you, you should ask them uh, about temporal arthritis, jaw claudication, have they had any other sort of um, visual obscurations at all. And you must always check their platelets, ESR and CRP just to exclude this because this is a very easily treatable cause of sight loss, but if you don't catch it in time, it can it can cause a reversible sight loss, and it does happen. Um, so uh, it's important to to manage these patients promptly. Other causes of acute vision loss that we get referred to are flashing lights and floaters, and these usually come with risk factors. So you can have detachments. So on the on the right image, you can see there's a shallow detachment. On the left, you can see there's a classic dome where the retina is sort of peeled off. So these can be quite subtle, but the risk factors include the patient having had any surgery recently to their eye or being short-sighted. And that's because they generally tend to have longer eyes. So they have sharper angles at the back, which can and, and hence the vitreous can detach earlier and pull the retina with it. Um, and, and the other sign is that um, uh, is, is, is age as well. So you have to consider those three, okay? Um, in patients who are diabetic, they can often present with uh, vision loss because of this condition that's shown on, on the image. On the left, you can see this is just basically hazy view of the back of the eye. This is because of a, of a, detach, uh, of a, of a vitreous hemorrhage. And it, on the right, you can see this being shown on the ultrasound scan. So you can see uh, this density in the, in the posterior segment. And for these patients, if you have a vitreous hemorrhage, when they have a history of diabetes and they've previously been treated for diabetic retinopathy, the cause is almost uh, always uh, uh, this. But these need to be referred to the ophthalmology clinic within a week or two, normally if they have diabetes. If they don't have diabetes, i.e. this is an unexplained cause of a vitreous hemorrhage, then they need to be referred more promptly because 50% of vitreous hemorrhage cases have uh, an underlying tear associated with them. So we have to manage it appropriately to prevent it from becoming a retinal detachment. So that's all I want to say on the abridged thing before I pass on to my colleague um, who will go through some scenarios with you, okay? Hi everyone, I'm Camille. So I'm gonna go through some very interesting scenarios. Some a bit more basic than others, um, but you will all um, come across them at some point, probably in a &E if you do rotate through there. Um, so the first scenario, I'm gonna say a, a 50 uh, year old uh, female comes to you with acutely sort of a painful eye, it's very red. Um, it woke her up in the middle of the night with this, the worst headache she's ever had. And she's had associated nausea and uh, vomiting. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little pause to think, but um, so this case is sort of a, a classic case of an acute angle closure glaucoma. And it typically does occur in the middle of the night because that's when the pupil dilates when it's dark and then the angle gets um, blocked up. Um, so patients typically present with reduced vision, a hazy cornea, and the pupil is fixed and mid-dilated. Um, it typically occurs in sort of females, um, Asians, and those who have sort of shallow anterior chambers. So that would be the opposite to what you would see in an open angle glaucoma. So if you think that all oh, the angle is close, it's quite a very small eye, and they tend to be hypermetropic. So these cases need urgent ophthalmic assessment. So we treat them in the initial stages 
um, with IV acetazolamide to try and reduce the pressure and topical treatment with um, glaucoma drops and topical steroids. And they'll also need an urgent um, peripheral iridotomy. So we make with the, with the laser a little hole in the iris to create another uh, drainage pathway. Right, so scenario number two, you have a 65 year old uh, gentleman who's just recently had cataract surgery. He comes to A&E with a very red eye reduced vision, he might um, say it was clear for the initial few days and then suddenly out of nowhere, um, it went downhill and the vision was very much reduced. Um, so again, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna try and point at um, a sign on the image there on the left, um, which Hassan alluded to previously. So what are we thinking about here? Um, so this is a case of what we call endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis is inflammation of the intraocular space, which is occupied by the vitreous humor. It can either be endogenous, so that's um, particularly for immune compromised uh, patients, or exogenous, like in this case, following trauma or surgery. Um, so risk factors include um, IVDU or contact lens wearers, if they have sort of blepharitis, um, if their immune system's down, or if they've had complicated, uh, complicated operations. So for cataract, if the posterior capsule ruptured. Um, and in terms of signs, um, you would get a very red, a very inflamed eye. So on the image uh, previously was a hypopian um, that you could see at the bottom there, which is the collection of the pus and the inflammatory cells. Um, so again, it's something that you would need to refer immediately to um, ophthalmology. So if you think that if a patient's had any sort of surgery and you have a very red eye, then it's that should ring sort of alarm bells there. Um, so the immediate treatment on our side would be intravitreal um, injection. So we give vancomycin and keftazidine and can also do a vitrectomy to um, try and clear up the inflammation there. Uh, right, so moving on to scenario number three. Um, so 65 year old female who comes to you with fever, malaise and this periocular pain. Her, both her upper and lower lids are a, li a little bit red um, and swollen. So what's going through your mind? So again, I've kept this fairly vague because obviously you could have um, just to keep multiple differential diagnosis. Um, so number one, what I'm hoping you're all thinking about um, so orbital cellulitis, and um, it is a medical emergency because it can cause visual loss and it can also be fatal. Um, these cases are usually joint care with um, ENT. Um, so the infective organisms include strep pneumonia, staph aureus, strep pygene, and haemophilus influenza, which is more common in children. Um, and then there are multiple risk factors. So sinus disease, which is typically the ethmoid sinus that's involved. Um, infections of uh, surrounding structures, so if they have dacrocystitis or a dental abscess. Uh, trauma, if they've had any septal perforation. Um, surgery, so orbital lacrimal and, and vitreoretinal retinal surgery. And finally, if they're immune compromised and you get an endogenous spread. Uh, so on this image, you can see the very tense lids. Um, it's a sort of an inflamed eye. You can see the proptosis. And this child had a subperiosteal abscess, um, which is visible on the scan there. And it's important for us ophthalmologists to be able to differentiate between preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, and other um, conditions such as cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, so this is a, a, a nice summary. So if, just to remember that preceptal cellulitis, you do not have proptosis. Um, the ocular motility, the visual acuity, color vision, um, and RPD, those are not there. So you wouldn't see those signs. In terms of investigation, so you do a full blood count. Blood culture would give you, um, studies have shown that it gives you quite a low yield. Um, the important one is the CT orbit sinus and brain um, to see where the, the abscess is and how much proptosis there is. In terms of treatment, it's IV antibiotics, but again, that will depend on your, uh, which ones to use will depend on your local uh, guidelines. 
We like to mark the, the extent of the skin inflammation to see if there's any um, uh, worsening during um, the stay in hospital. And they would need regular reviews, uh, reviews with um, ophthalmology to check their visual function. And uh, ENT input may also be necessary for, for drainage. And if they deteriorate, then you might have to repeat um, the CT scan to exclude any sort of other abscess formation. Um, so moving on to sort of the happy zoster of thalmicus. And again, I've put that there because it get, that would give you a similar picture. You might see in the initial stages just a slightly red sort of uh, lids and it can be quite hard to differentiate the, the two um, until they develop the actual vesicles. Um, so for happy zoster of thalmicus, it's the varicella zoster, which is a double-stranded DNA. Um, so for the primary infection, um, you would get chickenpox, but then when you have reactivation of the virus, which is usually dormant in the sensory ganglion, that's when you get shingles. Um, and involvement of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal, that typically occurs in about 15% um, of cases. Um, so clinical features for it, again, you get the, that viral sort of uh, prodrome. Um, you can get a pre-hepatic neuralgia, and that typically is an intermittent tingling with or um, severe constant electric sort of pain. Um, you get the rash within that um, dermatome, and again, that starts with papules, and then it tends to become vesicles, pustules, and then a dry sort of a scabby um, rash. Um, you can get what we call Hutchinson sign. And what that is, is um, involvement of the tip of the nose, and that would indicate nasociliary involvement. And then that's when you would likely get ocular involvement as well. So if we see that the vesicles are on, on the tip, then we think, oh, well, the eye might also have um, signs. And one of these signs are keratitis. So if you can see on the bottom image there, you have what we call a pseudodendrite. Um, so it's a little sort of staining ulcer there, um, but they can also get inflammation or uveitis inside the eye, and that typically occurs about a week or 10 days after the, um, the initial rash. Um, in terms of treatment, so we'd have to start um, a cyclic, well, any anti sort of antivirus straight away. Uh, the most common one used is a cyclovir, um, but you could also use um, valacyclovir. Um, or famcyclovir. Um, as ophthalmologists, we also like to add some lubricating eye drops or even topical um, steroids if we think there's uveitis or other forms of uh, inflammation there. Um, I'd like to st stress very much on the second point of the post-hepatic neuralgia, which can be awful. I mean, we have, um, uh, it can drag on for many months and years after the incident um, and it can cause a lot of depression for, for patients. So often what started um, is amitriptyline or, or other ones, and they, they are sometimes even referred to the, to the pain clinic to try and manage that type of uh, pain. Uh, right, so scenario number four. So we have a, let's say, 45-year-old gentleman that comes in with very tense, um, a very tense sort of eyelids. Um, you look and the eye looks uh, prop toes and it's very painful. The vision's reduced completely um, down. And when you try and examine the eye, you find that the pupil on that side's uh, not reactive and there's an RAPD. Um, there's restrictive ocular movements. Um, and so what, what is rushing through your head? So I'm hoping you're all thinking about what we call retrobulbar hemorrhage. And it can be spontaneous, but most often it's uh, following any sort of facial trauma. And what you have is an acute rise of the um, intraorbital pressure, and that comprise, uh, compromises the blood flow. And that would result um, in ischemia and optic nerve damage. So it's a bit like this orbital compartment syndrome. And that's catastrophic. So they could obviously uh, lose their vision on that side if not treated promptly. Um, so the immediate treatment, and that's um, obviously sometimes expected of a &E doctors to do this, is what we call a can canthotomy and cantholysis. So canthotomy is incision of the lateral ca um, canthal tendon, and cantholysis is disinsertion of that tendon. Um, so I'm going to see if this video works ahead um, to see how we... Oops. If not, I'll let Hassan to... No? 
Or skip on? Yeah, we can probably. Yeah. What I might do, because I don't want to, otherwise it'd be a gap, we, we might show it at the end. Um, but it's a very, if not, if we don't get time for it, um, then you could always uh, Google it. But it's very, it's very straight, um, it's fairly straightforward. You would anesthetize um, the area there. And as you can see on the uh, photo, I mean, it's a very tense eyelid, so the patient will be in pain, but you basically, you put a clamp in, in that area and then you sort of take scissors and cut that tendon there. So easier said than done, but you see remarkable results. I have seen patients going from counting fingers, hand movements to having near sort of 6-12 vision within minutes and hours. It's that um, instant, the results you can get and very important to learn. Um, right, so moving on to uh, trauma and globe ruptures. Um, so it can be classified um, as sort of blunt or sharp trauma. You can also get penetrating or perforating injuries where it's sort of through and through. Um, you can also classify it sort of anatomically. So if the um, iris is damaged or the sphincter sort of ruptures there, you can get medriasis, so it's a fix um, or a dilated pupil. Um, and you can get prolapse of the iris as seen as sort of the bottom image there on the um, left. Um, and I've put this slide because it's it's very important as you may if you're going through acute medicine or, or surgery or you might be the first doctor sort of to see this and it's very important to be aware depending obviously of, of the mechanism of injury and the, the history taken of what we call the hidden traumas so it's often with mechanics or people working with metal and high sort of velocity there um, so there are certain signs that you may see if you on the slit lamp. One is would be called a, a retroillumination uh, defect. So if you put the beam, which is the top picture there, put the slit lamp beam very small and right through the pupil, and then it will hit back the retina and the reflex you you get. You might see a hole in the iris. Obviously, some people might have thinner iris, but if you see sort of a definite round hole, that might be due to a, a penetrating injury. Um, another thing you can do is put fluorescein on the eye, is what we call the CEDL test. And if there is some um, intraocular content and fluid coming out, you will see a bit like a waterfall, sort of that green liquid, that staining coming out. And if, if that's the case, um, that's, um, you'll suspect a leak or um, any sort of trauma there. Um, can obviously take it, history is very important, but um, x-rays and CTs, um, and B scans for identifying these um, foreign bodies. Um, they can be very tricky to find. Um, I've had a case recently where we've had a, a metal um, foreign body in the eye, had to go twice to find it. And in the end, we used a magnet to attract and pull it out as hiding behind the iris. Um, so yeah, quite tricky little uh, things. Right, moving on to uh, chemical burns. Again, this is, very important. Um, I'd say take home message from this slide or if uh, anything you should remember is that for these cases, treat first and ask questions later. Um, these injuries are one of the most destructive of all um, trauma injuries for the eye and it can occur in domestic, industrial and, and sort of military settings. Um, and the alkali injuries are the worst ones because um, they cause this liquefactive necrosis and they penetrate the eye a lot deeper than the acids. Um, so patients would typically present with pain, a very tearing eye, and they'll tell you they've had to maybe sort of a chemical splashed in. Um, in terms of signs, um, Hassan's mentioned before of how you can pick up staining, um, but I'll just like to highlight, you've got to be aware of, of the absent staining. And that's the case when the whole of the epithelium is missing so it's actually staining the whole thing. And you might think, oh, no, it looks fine. But actually, that's because of the whole um, epithelium has gone there. And also be aware of the white uh, conjunctiva because that would indicate ischemia, um, which is not a good sign. So we actually prefer a red eye after a chemical injury. That's better um, than an, an absolute uh, a white eye there. And obviously irrigate, irrigate, irrigate till you get um, the right pH. Just to remind you that um, the sort of pH of tears can be slightly alkali, so of 7.4. So it's good to compare with the other eye. So um, just to, 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 to get a value there. Um, oh, that was another video. Oh, shall I press? <laughs> Did you put it? I don't think it is. Anyway, we'll go, we'll put the videos at the end. I think you can try 
Oh, should I try? Find control or shift and then clicking the link, maybe? Yeah, we'll have to then share the... Right, so bear with us. Asan is very much my... <laughs> if not, well, it's a, it's a video done by one of my um, consultants in Brighton. A lateral wall of the orbit as shown in this video can be decompressed. Periocular ecchymosis can be seen. And it's a lot harder than done, obviously, shows extreme when the eyelid is very tense there. Pulsation, with the vein almost winking as outflow is choked. Minimal external pressure on the globe would completely occlude outflow. This patient is under general anaesthetic, but this procedure may be done under local anaesthetic with generous local anaesthetic infiltration. The lateral canthus is clamped with an artery forcep and then cut along the crush line dividing skin and orbicularis towards the lateral orbital rim. This is a lateral canthotomy. The lower eyelid is drawn laterally and away from the globe with toothed forceps to put the lateral canthal tendon on stretch. Closed forceps or scissors can be used to identify the tendon. It feels almost like strumming a guitar string. It is then transected. This is lateral canthalysis. There may be a big egress of blood, as you see here, but if there is not, then the lateral canthus must be further opened. Initially, a small pad of fat called isolus pocket that sits between the lateral canthal tendon and the underlying orbital septum will prolapse. The septum can then be incised or divided to allow further orbital fat to prolapse and retrobulbar blood to escape. All right, perfect. So we're going to go back to the, the talk. Um, but yeah, just to highlight for, for the lateral canthotomy and canthalysis, they have to be done as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, they'd lose vision. Right, so moving on, still in sort of trauma cases, um, but we'll talk about orbital fractures. Um, I'm only going to touch upon the orbital floor because it's the most common of the fractures. Um, and there is actually a link with in, in terms of ethnicity, so it typically affects um, Caucasians or Asians. Um, and it can follow following um, a blow, usually, sorry, should say smaller than five centimeters there, like a, a tennis ball or, or a fist. Um, so you can either get um, a force transmitted by hydraulic compression, and then you get what we call a blowout fracture, or it can be directly transmitted along the orbital rim. So for blowout fractures, um, in terms of features, you'd get soft tissue, sort of swelling, bruising, edema. Um, you get vertical diplopia, and that's either a restriction of up, up gaze due to the tissue entrapment, uh, following prolapse or soft tissue swelling, tenting the extraocular muscles there. And ophthalmus, which is a sunken eye. Um, you can get infraorbital anesthesia, and that's damage to the infraorbital uh, nerve there, so you can get a bit of numbness. Um, and again, beware of the white blowout fractures, typically in children, so you get what we call green stick injuries. Um, so you see very minimal signs, um, but the actual muscle is trapped there, and that would need to be repaired as soon as possible. Um, so for these patients, if you see them in Amy, you'll obviously have to refer to MaxFax and ourselves. Um, so you'd initially have to advise the patients to refrain from blowing their nose. Um, that's to stop any sort of surgical emph um, emphysema and herniation of the sort of orbital contents in, near the fracture site. Um, you could consider starting antibiotic prophylaxis, that there's limited um, evidence for this. Um, and they would need uh, follow up with our orthoptics. And they tend to do what we call HESS charts, and that's to monitor sort of the eye movement. So they look at a board and, and point at different uh, points that they can see, and that would pick up what the um, eye muscles are doing. Um, so there's an inter interesting study that looked at when fracture should be repaired. Um, they tend to be, I mean, depending obviously on the signs, if you've got any double vision um, or n ophthalmos, they tend to be repaired fairly quickly within sort of two weeks. Um, but other fractures can easily wait um, a month and um, have very good results as well. Um, so scenario number five, we're, we're going now towards, um, I mean, it's still a very important topic, but more sort of uh, new, neurology related. Um, so you've got a, let's say, 55-year-old patient who comes in 
with a very um, meiosis, which is a small pupil, um, a slight ptosis on that side, a sunken eye, um, and what we call sort of anhydrosis, so lots of sweating on that side. And so what's going through your mind? So in this case, we have what we call Horner syndrome, which is um, obviously a medical emergency. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through that, the sympathetic pathway. So you've got what we call um, sort of the first order, so central lesions, and that the pathway goes from the hypothalamus um, to the cervical spinal cord. Um, and then you have second order, what we call preganglionic. And as you can see on the image, that goes over the pulmonary apex and that synapses um, in the cervical ganglion. And then you have third order um, neurons or post ganglion um, when it enters the cranium. So obviously depending on the site of the injury, you will have different causes. Um, interestingly, so you would typically get anhydrosis only in first order and second order uh, neurons, and that's because the fibers separate out at the cervical ganglion, so before um, the third order. And the important one there I've got, um, obviously underlined is the carotid artery dissection. So if you've got any suspicion um, of Horner syndrome, then you'd have to do an, a sort of urgent neuroimaging. And that typically involves angiography. So either sort of MRA or a, a, a high resolution CTA. Fine, so we've, this is the final sort of scenario and then we'll go back to the initial questions. Um, so you've got a, a patient here who's come in with uh, pain double, well, this patient won't have double vision as the eyelid is completely closed, but if they had only half a ptosis, they may get some diplopia there. Um, and if you do lift the eyelid up, um, you would see that the, as you can see, the eye is in a specific position and the pupil is also dilated. So what's going through your mind there? So that in this case, oh, and then this is how they may des describe the headache. So it'd be the worst headache ever or someone's kicked them in the back of the head. Again, this is a, a very important scenario. So, so in, it's a third nerve palsy. And that's very important because um, it can be the first sign of aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. And unfortunately, it could also be the last sign of the aneurysm before you get before the you get a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and obviously, um, that can be fatal. Um, so it can be classified um, whether it's complete or partial, whether it's pupil sparing or pupil involving. Um, it used to be now it's slightly outdated so that we were um, always concerned and only scanned whether the pupil was. Um, um, involved or not. So the, the reason for that is that in compressive uh, lesions, um, the pupil will become very fixed and dilated due to the paralysis of the sphincter papillae. Um, whereas in ischemic lesions, um, the pupil is spared. Um, and that's because in the outer fibers of the third nerve um, supply the ciliary muscles and the, the sphincter papillae. Um, but now we don't uh, differentiate um, so much in terms of pupil sparing or involving. We tend to scan um, everyone. So you, we would order an urgent um, MRI, again, MRA, and that would be to look for aneurysms, um, usually of the posterior communicating artery, even though the most common causes are sort of microvascular ischemia. But if they come in with that um, pain and if you're suspecting a third, um, they'd get a, a scan there. And that's my alarm bell ringing. <laughs> right, so in summary, so when to refer to ophthalmology. Um, so obviously we've got some very specific um, injuries. So acute angle closure is very important. Chemical injuries, any penetrating or blunt eye injuries and endophthalmitis. Um, that would be an, an immediate sort of uh, phone call to the ophthalmologist, uh, even if it's in the middle of the night. Um, in terms of more urgent um, referrals, that could be sort of first thing in the morning, um, unless it's been less than two hours. So the central retinal artery occlusion, um, there's very limited, there's, there is some treatment, even though it's, um, there's sort of limited evidence and it's not always successful, but obviously the sooner it's done, the better. Um, bacterial keratitis, iritis, giant cell arteritis, um, I would say you'd have to start steroids beforehand. Do not wait 
um, to call us. You can do the sort of full blood count, ESR, CRP, and if you suspect it, um, then start the steroids, um, yeah, even before any um, temporal artery biopsy or anything else, and finally retinal detachment. Um, and so in conclusions, do the basics with vision, color vision, feels, pupils. Uh, we would be very happy if you call us and you have those. I mean, obviously feels can be a bit tricky, um, but you would make the ophthalmologist very happy there. Um, and it's a heavily visual specialty. So I do, if, if some of you are hesitating or not sure what, what to do later on, it's something I would, I mean, I've always loved surgery. And, um, and what, I mean, I think an ophthalmology does offer, I think, incredible surgery. Um, and it is fascinating. So I'll advise you to, to have a look and, and play around with a slit lamp if you have access to them in any. Um, and yeah, think about your differentials for, for red eye and uh, visual loss that hopefully we've covered uh, most of uh, today. Um, so if you've got more questions, I think we, you can go to, to that link provided. Um, oh yeah, so we, we can now go back to the uh, questions. So question one, so get Hassan here as well, if he wants to mm -hmm. participate. Cool. Um, right. Do you want to go through them yeah, uh, first? Okay. Go for it. So with, with question one, so just to remind you, it was the 63-year-old lady who came in with a background of hypertension and type 2 diabetes, um, double vision, droopy eyelid, um, and sort of a, a ptosis in the eye di um, out, down and out there. So what did you think? Well, I might just give the answer there. So the answer there was a third nerve palsy caused by a cerebral aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. Um, so it is a third nerve. So obviously it's got the classic features of the eye um, down and out there as the lateral rectus is sort of uh, working and pulling the eye. And I have made it sort of a trick question by telling you she had a background of diabetes, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's due to the diabetes there. Um, and the reason for that, if you get the pupils involved. Um, so if you remember when I said all the fibers on the outside are for the pupils, so when you have a compressive lesion, um, they typically, um, that, that's when you get that fixed dilated pupil. Um, and I can't remember if I said it was a painful, yes, and the headache as well. So any sort of uh, pain, you should, uh, alarm bells should be going off as well. Um, so that was that. Um, so hopefully a slightly easier one, but you have a 30 year old male with chronic lower back pain, um, possibly sort of ankylosing spondylitis, so complaining of a red painful eye, blurred vision. Um, so what is the answer there? So the answer there is sort of an anterior uveitis. So you can see the sort of keratic precipitates, that irregular pupil, um, on that side, uh, which is due to the posterior sinechi. Um, obviously all the other answers on that were all, all due to inflammation, but so keratitis is the front layer of the eye, but the, you, you've got inflammation here in the middle bit. So, um, and then obviously the back layer of the eyes, we don't have a, a photo of the back, but they may have associated retinitis and other things, but that would be your, your classic example of an anterior uveitis. So this question was your 29 year old with that uh, linear staining. Um, and really what we wanted to know was what's the immediate management to consider. I suppose when we're on this topic, what's the immediate management not to consider? It's topical steroids, okay? Uh, but what we wanted to get at was that this is a viral. So you would consider topical antiviral. You can consider oral antiviral as well, but uh, Topical antiviral will have a direct effect on the cornea, so it's it's probably preferable in this. It's it's the best answer in this uh, in these choices. Um, the next one is a young lady that complains of blurry vision in the right eye, painful to move the eye in all positions, uh, and fendoscopy neurological examination is unremarkable, but the MRI brain shows two lesions so uh, the you know when in the in the scenario when you have an rapd and you have uh, uh, an eye that's you know painful to all movements 
the answer is likely to be optic neuritis. And, and this is sometimes uh, quite, you know, quite debilitating and requires, um, you know, we, we do send um, the referral off to the ophthalmologist, but there's very little that we can do for this. Um, you know, there is evidence for giving these patients um, intravenous steroids, but it only reduces the the uh, the extent of the um, symptoms they're having. It doesn't necessarily change any prognosis, for, so it's 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 a very difficult uh, diagnosis to manage and an important one to know. This is uh, a chemical splash into the eye, and the uh, of the choices, what we want to know is if you can recognize which one of these fluids would be the most dangerous to the eye. And uh, what we were alluding to was the oven cleaning fluid because that's alkali. And uh, the reason why alkali uh, chemicals are, are more dangerous is because they can actually eat away through the, through the ocular tissues. So, uh, so the rule of thumb is basically anything that goes into the eye, irrigate it um, until you've reached a, a pH that is comparable to the other unaffected eye. Uh, and that's what we want to get at. So um, thank you very much for listening to both of us um, and, and tuning in in the evening. Um, any questions for us? Uh, I suppose uh, you can probably pass to Rituja. Rituja, you can ask us. Or... Great. So um, thank you, guys. That was fantastic. Uh, we do have some questions, um, both, I think, from junior doctors and medical students. Um, so the first one I want to present to you guys is um, a question alluding to if you're working in primary care. So if you're a GP um, and you see someone with uh, suspected acute closed angle glaucoma, um, what do you do in that situation, given that you are in the GP surgery? Do you want to do you want to go for it? Or I mean, I would I would probably. First thing is I would make sure that I am uh, confident or, or I have reasonable evidence that this is angle closure. So I would look for those features. So um, semi-dilated pupil, hazing of the cornea. And, and if the patients probably had uh, cataract surgery, it's unlikely that they have angle closure. Uh, so that's an important thing to rule out. However, if I am confident that this is angle closure and I need to manage it, then you, you can call your ophthalmologist uh, who's on call for immediate advice because they can advise you what to do. But I think commonly what we've done in this uh, situation, which, which does arise, is we give them, um, we ask them to be cannulated, give an IV uh, acetazolamide, and also to give an oral acetazolamide. And that usually brings the pressure down. Uh, and once you've got that in the system, you can probably transfer the patient for further management in the nearest A&E or the nearest ophthalmic unit. But definitely, I would say get on the phone and ask us for advice because we can tell you exactly what medication to give and when to give. Yeah, and I think mo most units have um, eye casualties in the daytime, if, if, it, if that's the case, to so discuss or be seen straight away. Um, I think obviously putting cannulas and having access to acetazolamide, which is uh, often called Dimox, can be difficult in sort of primary care. Um, so it might sometimes, obviously, it's easy to be seen in the eye casualty um, to make that. But as, as, as Hassan said, so if they've had cataract surgery, it's very likely the angle is open. Um, so you could ask them, have you had, obviously, a previous surgery to that eye? Um, um, and yeah, that would point you in that direction. But yes, call us if you're, you're having that suspicion. Great, thank you. Um, next question is um, actually on the, um, on the same theme of AAU. Um, what tends to come first, the systemic signs or local eye signs? That's an interesting question. So, so uveitis uh, can be caused by lots of things. So it can be because of autoimmune conditions, HLA B27 positivity. Uh, it can be nonspecific. So you may not get systemic signs. Uh, occasionally, uh, you know, you, you can have patients who are on chemotherapy who can have uh, uveitis uh, because of an, you know, because of their medication. So they can have systemic features, but there isn't there isn't necessarily a correlation. Yeah. 
um, it can just be you know isolated uh, without any systemic features. Mostly, it is actually. Yeah, we don't know. It. We don't. There's no cause sort of known. Some people obviously are more prone to it, but there's no direct link between systemic and um, sort of ocular signs for that. Okay, thank you. Um, next one is what stops bacterial conjunctivitis from going deeper into the eye when left untreated? That's a very, very good question. I suppose, how long do you leave it untreated? I don't know. We, 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 we haven't yeah. seen that. I mean, it also depends on what um, uh, infectious agent is, is, is causing it. But usually, you know, infections do get... Um, you know, walled off, uh, you know, within the conjunctiva or, or the, 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 you know, the, uh, the cornea also protects it to a loss. But if you left it for a very long time, I suppose it'll just perforate through, wouldn't it? Uh, you would get I mean, I think your body would find it. I think your eye is fairly robust. Um, so unless you have a sort of a, a different uh, bug, like a pseudomonas that's very aggressive or you're a contact lens wearer, um, you would, yeah, it wouldn't go through. Mm you would yeah i think it, yeah it tends to resolve fairly quickly on its own there um you can get secondary signs for viral um con conjunctivitis you can get membranes um in the eye if left there so it's because of all the inflammation um and it's in the in in the conjunctiva and that can cause lots of problems um which can be a bit trickier to sort of treat there but less so for bacterial Okay, thank you. Um, another question is asking, um, why is oven cleaning fluid worse than bleach? Um, I think they thought they were yeah, both. Yeah, so all, all of them were um, acids apart from uh, the yeah. oven cleaning. Ah, that makes sense. But yeah, um, you, have to know, you have to obviously, I mean, we don't remember this, but look, if, whether it's an alkali or, or an acid, basically. I mean, they're all awful, but alkalis are worse. Um, and we have a question regarding GCA. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a cutoff time from since the onset of the patient's symptoms, like for example, there is in stroke, um, that you need to sort of act in order to treat GCA? I think the sooner the better. Mm -hmm. If you have a high suspicion of a patient with GCA, I think you ought to start treatment as quick as possible. Um, that's yeah, what I yeah. Saying. and if you can also try and do bloods, but then start steroids straight away before even any eye assessment or anything, if you can, because you obviously you want to avoid the other eye getting involved. And then we've seen some very sad cases of people going blind or losing the other eye as, as steroids were not started hmm. uh, soon enough. And if it's not GCA, then we'll just stop the steroids. It's easier um, that way. I mean, we all know steroids have side effects, but if it's only given for a day or two, and then we can obviously reassess if that's the case or organize an artery biopsy. Um, but yeah, the sooner the better. Great. Um, and I think we have time for just one more question. I'm kind of combining two uh, medical, I think medical students questions together regarding um, a career in ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is asking how competitive it is to get into um, ophthalmology training. And if you have any advice and um, how do you recommend medical students to gain experience in microsurgery aside from attending courses organized by the Royal College? Sorry, what was the last thing, Rutuja? A medical students asking about? Microsurgical courses, is it? Yeah, microsurgical courses. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, well, um, I mean, also so... other experience in microsurgery aside from attending courses, sorry. Oh, I okay, see. fine, I yeah. See, see. Mm. Well, well, the first thing is I think if you, I think what I would say is for people who want to do ophthalmology, don't get phased by the competition. I think if you want to do ophthalmology, it, it, is, it is competitive on two fronts. One is the number of uh, applicants per place. Secondly, is it's got a long list of, uh, you know, things that it wants, the application. It keeps changing every year. So keep uh, up to date with that. I think on, it's, it's published on the seven uh, website. Uh, but certainly you can take off all those things. And, and, and if you're driven enough, you know, you may not get in the first year, but you'll definitely get in the, in the year after. So it, it's just a matter of just signing off that checklist and, and microsurgical skills is one of them. 
Uh, I think the one that's recognized on the form does keep changing, but but I think when I was certainly applying, it was the, you had to do the microsurgical skills course from the college, which is in two parts now. So it, it can be, it can be a, a you know, costly exercise, but there are other microsurgical courses being done, which sometimes get advertised on iDocs. Um, but I'm, you, you're never sure how they will be perceived um, on the application form. So I think, look at your application form, what does the portfolio want? And then, and then go for these courses and, and, and select them. And then right. Hassan's quite humble, but I think some trainees in our dean room, perhaps himself, have all also found ways to do sort of microsurgery at home with a, an iPad, I mean, mm -hmm. you Hassan, and, and, and ways to practice at home without attending sort of a microsurgery course. So I don't know if you want to mention Yeah, so, so, so you can, yeah. So, I mean, if you're keen, uh, you can, um, you can ask your um, uh, sort of, you know, your local ophthalmic unit to sort of give you a couple of videos on how they do suturing and you can get certain models and you can do them at home, you know, using a, using a phone even, uh, you can practice your microsurgical skills course and you can log it. But again, I, I don't know how the college will perceive it if, and how you would show that as evidence. But certainly if you're interested in microsurgical skills, definitely you can, um, you can do that, um, definitely. Great, thank you so much guys. I think um, that's all the time we have for our questions. Um, so I wanted to say again, a massive thank you to Camille and Hassan for doing the webinar. Um, I think it's fantastic because um, ophthalmology is something that I think a lot of people are like interested in and, and it's really good to have this in order to delve a bit deeper into a specialty. Um, and thank you viewers for again um, attending another webinar. Um, a couple of things to mention is that we're going to have our 2021 lineup coming up very soon. If you want to hear more about that then obviously follow our social media channels or um, subscribe to our mailing list and you'll get some more information about that very soon. Um, and secondly, at the end of the webinar, um, you will have a page pop up with a post course questionnaire and on completion of that, you'll get your certificate of attendance. So don't forget to, um, to complete that in order to give us any feedback about any good points or any things that we can work on. Um, and yep, yeah, I think that's all from me. So thank you again, guys. Thank you, Ratija. Thank, Thank you so much. And have a